I'm Pranay Budev and this is an instructional video on how to apply a walking leg hip spike for paediatric femoral fracture. Walking leg hip spike is mainly for low energy fractures, so you're not looking at your high energy in type injuries. They're usually short, oblique or spiral type fractures um, and they tend to be in a younger age group of course, so you know six and under typically. So stuff that we need, uh, first we've got some fluff for the belly, we've got some felt for the lining of the cast so it doesn't cause any irritation to the skin. We then go on to our stockingette. This is the stockingette for the part of the body. As you can see, we've uh, cut out the bit that will go up the abdomen, followed by the part for the good leg, which is left alone, and obviously a bit that goes down the fractured leg, which is extended. And what covers the rest of that leg is a single stockingette, which is quite narrow in size, which essentially is used as like a cylinder cast. We have some scotch cast material. I typically use two inch and three inch material for that. We have some veil band, obviously, to provide support and some tensor band, which really helps uh, when you're covering up the veil band before you apply the plaster and really aids when you're removing it. Uh, the reason we use scotch cast is just in case we need to do wedging. It gives you the uh, amount right strength of material to allow you to do that. And obviously, you then got your simple inch pink and tapes and a pair of scissors. And most important of all is you need a plaster tech that knows what they're doing and knows how to apply a hip spiker. Okay, so this is a spiker table. We've got the long part, uh, and this is basically the bit that stays inside the groin. You then get extra parts here, and this is essentially to gap and give them some support. So you just pop that over there and screw in um, the, the perineal post. This then slots in underneath into a hole. So the head is typically on the very top of the board. Sometimes in a larger child, there'll be quite a gap here, and that's something obviously that's not safe, especially when you've got the main part of the body. Uh, so we have another piece that can go in from the top, slides in to cover the gap. The most important part with this is when you apply your stockingette to the child, that stockingette actually goes below this area here, and that way you're not going to be attaching the child to the table with plaster. So we have our child with a, a paediatric femoral fracture uh, here. They're under general anaesthetic in theatre. We've moved them onto the theatre table, which ideally should be radiolucent. And then as a team, we've lifted the child up with the anaesthetist and we got the spiker table put underneath them and we've gently put the child back down. We're then going to expose them up to the level of the nipples. First thing to see is that that should essentially correspond with the bottom part of the body of the spiker table and the perineal post is in between the legs. This is the body stocking it that we started off with, with the long limb going down the fractured leg. So as you see, you'd have to lift the child up ever so slightly, bring the proximal part of this up to the level of the nipples and essentially stretch this down. We've got a bit of extra felt that we tend to put at the back and this is really just because the child's going to be spending quite a lot of time on their back. The first part of this is to apply a cylinder cast with the knee in 45 degrees of flexion. And then we're going to connect the two limbs of the stockingette and tape them together. So we just use some simple uh, tape for that. As you can see, the contralateral limb does not have any stockingette going down it and will stop at the level at which the hip flexes. As you can see, we've just taken some simple felt, sticky felt, and we've cut in uh, some longitudinal limbs for that. And we're going to place that at the top and also at the level of the ankle. This is like you're applying a cylinder cast with the knee in 45 degrees of flexion. You can do this with the hip in complete extension if it's easier. Unfortunately, we can't abduct our mannequin's limb, so we're gonna flex that up as well. Now that we've got the veil band in place, we wanna ensure that we've got adequate fracture reduction. The main thing to understand is that these fractures tend to drift into varus. So the most important maneuver is to actually apply a valgus force at the level of your fracture. And I do this in theater with the II machine coming in from the contralateral side. And if you haven't had to extend the hip, you can just do a true AP, but if you've had to flex the hip like as so, you can then tilt your beam accordingly. What you want to do is find the level of your fracture and under life screening, just apply a gentle valgus force to that level. And that's what you would do once you apply your scotch cast to ensure it's molded in a valgus position. So we'll apply some tensor band on here first. As I said, this is something that uh, stops the plaster from sticking to um, uh, the veil band and actually when you take off your plaster, it eases removal as well. So you want about 30 degrees of abduction at your hip uh, throughout this. Of course, the mannequin doesn't allow us to do that, but you need to do that to get adequate spacing. But 30 degrees of abduction is perfect to allow perineal care for a child, uh, in addition to seating in car seats and in a pram, which is where they will spend most of their time for the next four to six weeks. We'll apply our first layer of scotch cast. 
and then we know as soon as we've sort of gone past the level of the fracture site, that's when we're going to start applying that valgus mould at the level of the fracture. I do tend to apply a slight over valgus mould on that, looking for around 5 to 10 degrees, understanding that it will tend to drift into varus. Uh, in my experience, the ones I haven't put into excessive valgus mould, those are the ones that I've needed to wedge at 10 days. We can now start applying our velban uh, to the torso. So my job now is pretty simple. I'm just holding the fracture in the cylinder cast, holding it nice and straight while Helen's applying uh, the rest of the spike ring. The typical corner that's always missed, we put with some extra fluff there and I use my hand to support that as well. Before applying our tensor band and then our scotch cast. So on the contralateral limb, we've essentially pulled up the stocking edge so it can allow the contralateral limb to flex up. You should be allowed to flex that limb up to 90 degrees. So it's typically proximal to that hip flexor crease is where you want your plaster to be. If it's not, you can always chop that out later and, and uh, support it with some, um, again, some more um, inch pink. 45 degree flexion at the knee, 45 degree flexion at the hip, 30 degrees of abduction and pressure at the level of the fracture site. That's, what, that's the, essentially the reduction manoeuvre uh, for this technique. We're now rolling down the stockingette. We want the spiker to be up towards the level of the nipples and ensure that you've got adequate fluff in between um, so the child can eat and have some space for their abdomen. So again, ensuring not to miss that corner, which is quite difficult in this one-legged spiker technique but essentially you've got to put your rolls more oblique so that you don't go too far distal on the unaffected limb, but you definitely still get that corner on uh, the fractured limb. And in the initial descriptions of this, in this walking leg spiker technique, they found that a huge amount of them who did walk, which they typically do quite early, fractured at the level of the, um, of the, level of the hip that you put it on. So we apply a reinforced layer of scotch cast along the front, which is then nice and firm and hard and prevents it from fracturing. Typically about eight to nine layers of plaster material should be used at this site and placed along the anterior part, essentially re reinforcing the hip as so. Now the joy of doing this technique is uh, children tend to walk very early. It, uh, we've had a lot of children who walked with it between three and four weeks on the fractured limb post-op, but obviously having the unaffected limb not in plaster has allowed children to weight bear, pivot and transfer, and therefore that reduces the caregiver burden quite significantly. They're able to toilet themselves, they're able to get up from bed uh, and get up from a chair. And it's really as a child gets more and more confident following their fracture that they'll start testing by putting their foot down on the floor on the left side, um, as is in this case, on their fractured limb and will start walking. And you know, 100% at four weeks is what we're looking at so far in the patients we perform this technique on. The other nice thing is if they have, uh, if they're wearing nappy still, you can still put a nappy on with it going over the cast. And actually, if they're wearing pants and they are uh, potty trained, they can actually pull up pants because it is just a one leg that's affected. We can then apply our final layer of scotch cast. Uh, the brighter, the better, really. We tend to give children an option of what colours they want. And Helen is notorious for having sparkles in her pocket at this point. There is now soft cast material. Soft cast is uh, one that unwraps and we have trialed uh, using this as it obviously means we don't need to use a plaster saw for spiker cast removal that we do in the plaster room at around six weeks. Uh, but what we found is if you do need to wedge the plaster, it's just too soft and doesn't allow, it doesn't have the um, stability to let you do that. Perfect, so there we have it. So that's our one-legged spiker cast, 45 degree flexion at the knee, 45 degree flexion at the hip, valgus moulding at the fracture site, um, 30 degrees of abduction, reinforce at the front, and the contralateral limb can completely move alongside with it. The final step now is you would get your x-ray machine in, something metallic, mark it, make sure you're at the level of the fracture, and then Helen, if you'll mark that for me, just mark that level of the fracture all the way across, mainly coming medially towards the groin as well. 
because that is the area where you're going to have to wedge the plaster at seven to ten days if it's required and it's usually because it's drifting into various it's a wedge on the medial aspect of the thigh after seeing Pete and Cash in action in their previous uh, ODMs and uh, instructional videos, I realised I had to make one mistake to feel part of the family. And that for me was missing out the fluff that goes inside the tummy. So typically this will be applied when you put your stocking end in. And the most important thing is don't forget it. Don't leave it in when you finish. Always remember to take it out. Or like I did, remember to put it in to start with. This is the view from the other side. As you can see, I, I explained where we marked the, um, the cast. This is, would be at the level of the fracture. And if the child does need wedging performed at the seven to day mark, it is typically in a half that you would open up around the 30 to 40% of the circumference of that side. And then you can wedge it using a 20, 25 millimeter plastic wedge or cork wedge. Once that's in, you can then reapply another layer of scotch cast or soft cast to your preference. Take another x-ray and you'll typically see that the correction, that angulation has been sorted. With regards to the contralateral limb, you should be able to get the hip up to nine degrees. If you can't, you can always trim the excess around that side. But this is the mobile side. This is the side that they're gonna be using the most and you want them to be standing, transferring and walking on this leg as that's typically what gets them walking quicker on the fractured leg. So I always tell the parents that the point of putting this particular spiker on is to encourage weight bearing as soon as possible. It is a walking one-legged hip spiker. So the rules are, is there are no rules. They're allowed to stand on their fractured limb. They're allowed to walk on their fractured limb as soon as they feel they're comfortable. Most start walking between the three and four week mark. And then I tend to leave the plaster on for a further two weeks. So I would say all my patients are having their spiker on for six weeks in total, um, with the vast majority walking between three and four weeks. And there it is. That is the walking one-legged hip spiker and how we apply it.